stories is there is a U.S. business that they have been looking at that has employees in these That's what they've done is they paid them in advance and told them to go seek shelter and they ask them to email them once a week to let them know that they're still alive. We can't get it the first time. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you uh, who are guests, I'm Carol Orbison, president of the club, and I welcome all of you to our meeting today. In spite of that breezy, cold, nasty, <laughs> if you parked in the, in the garage a bit distant from here, you really felt it coming over. Um, I'd like to um, welcome our guests from Valpo, our Kiwanians from Valpo. So happy to have you. And I'd like to also welcome uh, Steve and Patricia Ingram our, from our Indiana district. Thank you. And I'd also like to welcome and thank for coming Brad Boyd and Tracy Lane Get. Uh, I've got a guest from Qantas International. So we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there someone from the Valpo Club? Thanks. You got my back. Oh, you got it. <laughs> my name is Kevin Hagen. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, at our club, usually when you're asked to do the invocation, you have to come up with something. Uh, I was handed the <laughs> That's really nice. Join me, please. Hear my voice. For it is the voice of the victims of all wars and violence among individuals and nations. Hear my voice, for it is the voice of all children who suffer and will suffer when people put their faith in weapons and war. Hear my voice when I beg you to install into the hearts of all human beings the wisdom of peace, the strength of justice, and the joy of fellowship. Hear my voice, for I speak for the multitudes in every country and in every period of history who do not want war and are ready to walk the road of peace. Hear my voice and grant insight and strength so that we may always respond to hatred with love, to injustice with total dedication to justice, to need with the sharing of self, to war with peace. Hear my voice and grant unto the world your everlasting peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Just a few announcements before we begin our program. Uh, we would like to appreciate uh, those Kiwanians who are celebrating anniversaries. Fill it nicely, 48 years. Is Philip here? 48 years. Um, uh, former President Don Steele, 40 years. And Dan Miller, 10 years. Uh, next announcement, semi-annual dues for April 1 through September 30th will uh, start this week. Thanks to all of you for your commitment to Kiwanis and what you and all of us do for the children of our community. We were joined last week on Zoom by a phenomenal storyteller, Dan Grunfield. His book, By the Grace of the Game, is a multi-generational family epic detailing history's only known journey from Auschwitz to the NBA. Dan's uh, dad, Ernie, won an Olympic gold medal for Team USA in 1976, about a decade after the Grunfields arrived in America as refugees. It was really a, a, a wonderful program 
as we all know by Zoom, um, it was, for those of you who were able to turn on and listen to it, it was a super program. Um, um, our 76th annual state basketball finals lunch was also amazing on Friday, March 24th. Our first one since 2019, which made it all the more special. And I want to um, talk about it again. The Kiwanis Foundation of Indianapolis presented five scholarships to the top academic basketball scholars in Marion County. That's always, that's always fun. Since 1991, more than $170,000 has been awarded to 155 student athletes through the support of the foundation. This includes annual awards. Jim Mills' family was in attendance to congratulate the $1,500 memorial scholarship, and we also extended $1,000 academic scholarships to four other players. Thanks to the leadership of David Wright and Mike Halstead and their committee, comprised of Bill Dubois, Steve Farrow, Graham Honecker, Chris Kaufman, and Trina Rudabush. Thanks to Eric and Lamika Steele for their fun giveaways at the end of the event. We were joined by key players in the city and our partnerships with the Pacers and the Indiana High School Athletic Association made this a wonderful event. Uh, Quinn Buckner offered advice to the teams. Pacer photographer Mark Krieger and sideline reporter Jeremiah Johnson were at our lunch, and then on the court covering the games on Sunday, or on Saturday. Indiana sports talk host Bob Le uh, Level joined us again to interview in, uh, IHSAA commissioner and Kiwanian Paul Nydick, and the final eight coaches along with a key player. These outstanding players are certainly role models in our community, and several received Mental Attitude Awards from the Indiana High School Athletic Association. Award-winning sports reporter Kyle uh, Naden Reed served as our MC and wrote about us in the IHSAA uh, basketball, wrapping up the 2021-22 season from A to Z. K is for Kiwanis. Um, he stated, I appreciate the Kiwanis Club for asking me to host the state finals luncheon this Friday, the Friday before the games. I have hosted the postseason football luncheon for several years. The Kiwanis Club makes that a special day for lots of people. It's fun to see those athletes recognized for their athletic and academic achievements, and it certainly was. As you know, our international convention is coming to Indianapolis between June 8th and June 11th. Be sure to sign up to attend and even volunteer at the airport uh, greeter, as an airport greeter, or at the welcome disc. disc, disc. Um, the link to sign up for those um, volunteer activities is in the chat box. The Indiana District is hosting a fun social on Friday night, June 10th at the Slippery Noodle. Be sure to sign up for that before tickets are sold out. I'd like to invite, oh no, I'd like to invite Steve Ingram to the microphone to say a few words. Thank you, Steve. Carol, 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> 20, go for it. <laughs> We have a uh, kind of a tradition in our club, the Balboldoon Club. When one of our speak, when one of the members of the club gets up to uh, uh, speak, it's usually a, a reproarious clapping of one. <laughs> so that was our tribute back there for that. Uh, it's good to be here with the Indianapolis Club. We've made an inner club up here today. Uh, Pat and I had a drive; they wouldn't let us on the plane, so <laughs> it's okay. All right. Uh, I've always had a special place in my heart for the Indianapolis Club because of the Indianapolis Club. We have a scholarship similar to your Lincoln Awards, uh, which is one of my favorite things to do on a yearly basis, and that's because of you guys. We came to that and we were so moved, and uh, so thank you for that. Uh, 
One thing I did want to talk about, it seems like whenever I come to this club, I'm running for an office or something, <laughs> and I'm always asking for something. Uh, I'm running for international trustee. I'll be one of five candidates for three spots. So if you can make it to the international convention, and you know, if I can slip you a 20 or something to get your vote, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be absolutely wonderful. And uh, the dinner Friday night at the Slippery Doodle, uh, it's gonna be us, Indiana folks, and 500 of our closest friends. So it's gonna be a nice time for us to uh, get together and we've got some sweet t-shirts that say Steve on them. It's got a B on it, it's sweet and it's yellow, so you guys all want one of those. Just to wear those around and be helpful. And if you get a few minutes to work on uh, the campaign booth, that'd be great too. So that's all I have. Uh, and then we, uh, we also have another candidate in the room, uh, past president of the Valpo Noon Club, uh, Doug McMillan is throwing his hat in the ring to be governor. So, uh, it's going to probably take you more than a 20 to vote for him. <laughs> but he, he's a good guy and a fantastic volunteer and a, a great person. So, you got a couple candidates in the house, so if we can get your support during the International Convention, we'd appreciate it. And thank you for your hospitality, as always. <laughs> programs. Uh, next week we've got Gerald Harkness. Uh, he's coming to us from Zoom because he's on location uh, shooting his next documentary. Um, so I appreciate the uh, flexibility there. We've got service leadership uh, program coming up. Indiana Tourism Week. Uh, the Symphony Orchestra is going to join us, um, I believe without their instruments. <laughs> but I don't know if anyone noticed on the way in, uh, the speakers outside were playing recordings of the ISO. So you can enjoy them starting to you know, walk out. Uh, but again, please check uh, the website, watch the newsletter, join for as many programs virtually and live as you can. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers, why you came today. Uh, David Wright is the Vice President of Ministry Services at TCM International Institute. They educate Christian leaders from more than 45 countries through an accredited graduate institute. Uh, he has served as chair of our basketball state finals luncheon for many years and has been a member of the downtown Qantas Club since February of 1998. Joining him is Brad Boyd, the area director, global membership and education for Qantas International. That is the longest title ever. Congratulations. <laughs> Director of Coupon Chief Whipping Boy. <laughs> Director of things. Um, Brad's responsible for training future leaders and sharing ideas and strategies to grow the organization's membership base, add new clubs, and strengthen existing ones. Today they're joining us to talk about something that's probably on the front of our minds on a daily basis for the last month or so, um, innovation in and more so the humanitarian impacts and how we can make a difference. Gentlemen. I've now been with uh, the Big House uh, Global <laughs> Headquarters for eight years and I've never spoken on anything other than membership, so <clears throat> Excuse me, it's rather refreshing to talk about something different. I'm not an expert, though, on what we're doing over in Ukraine, but I have established some connections with some key people over there. I think most of you may be aware that we formed a club in Kyiv uh, back on October 1st of 2007. Uh, they've been working uh, mostly with two orphanages uh, located in the Kyiv region, uh, Makariv and Baryshka districts, and um, they but since the, uh, 
the war has started, they're actively cooperating with the crisis centers, working with street children in Kyiv, as well as working with teenagers and partnering with the only Ukraine private school for children with autism. So uh, pretty awesome. Um, and I look back at their Facebook page. If you want to reach them, I think I just put in uh, Facebook Kiwanis Club of Kyiv, but their formal one is uh, just backslash Kiwanis UA. We'll also get you there, but this Laura Paklova has been in touch, and I'll uh, share some of her comments as I wrap up here in a couple minutes. I want to leave most time for David because he's got more boots on the ground uh, information to share with us and everything. But they actually, if you look at their Facebook page and their website, uh, they organized Easter egg hunts for children in 2017, 2018, and they even put together a princess ball for little girls in 2018 and 2019, and it's so cute and so innocent. It just really hits you the stark uh, difference between the photos they now are posting in terms of the war and the ravages of war compared to the wonderful things they did for kids with Easter egg hunts and princess uh, balls and that type of thing. So they only have about 15 members and I have not been able to get updates as to whether they've lost any of those. Um, Godspeed, I hope not. Um, but they also uh, have, if anyone is interested, and that um, their actual uh, contact information, if you want to directly contact them, is Ukraine underscore journey at yahoo.com. And Laura uh, usually monitors most of the communications there. Um, we have from Kiwanis International, I think most of you probably saw uh, some splash of three different organizations that we think uh, would have the infrastructure in place to meet the needs of Ukrainian children immediately. Obviously, David's cause could probably use some dollars too. He was telling me about how they're now able to direct some monies over there to them. But the three that uh, we've really spelled out, one is UNICEF, and they called, you know, we've had close relationships with them through the IDD campaign, the Eliminate Project, and uh, so we have very close a long-standing relationship there. The International Committee on the Red Cross, um, and Mary Marsh was the one that I bow down to. Even though I was on the board for about 15 years, she really has been the stalwart that has stayed with them, and they just do an incredible work, and they're actually um, supporting a lot of the efforts, and again, those boots on the ground things. And then Save the Children, and that's another one that delivers life-saving aid to vulnerable children in Ukraine and around the world. So those are three causes if you're interested. I'll get Kelly this information and hopefully we can get it in the newsletter or post it. Jay? Well, and also the Salvation Army, we have Amen. Center Corps. Okay. We just sent someone from the Indiana Division to uh, Key. Okay. Uh, so we're going to so to primarily uh, with food and, uh, and supplies. Okay. I know we have a lot of downtown Kwanians that are active on the board and in volunteer things with Salvation Army as well. So I'll go back and let some folks know that perhaps we should add them to the list and everything. Um, I did check and they actually are starting, for those of you that might be insomniacs, I know for me I get up sometimes way early, um, they've started a communication and prayer uh, weekly sort of gathering for families, children, and defenders. And they are holding that every Thursday at 11 o'clock Kiev time which I checked is 4 a.m. here in Indy. So if any of you want to rally and get up at 4 a.m., uh, it's a Zoom conference. I've got the Zoom link here, and again, I'll get that to Kelly so that we can uh, get that around for any of you that might be interested in joining in one of those um, prayer circles and, and getting a live update from them. Um, also, just wanted to quickly read a post. Um, I asked Laura whether she could share a little bit more detailed information so yeah, I could share it with all of you. And so this is fresh as of uh, very late Tuesday night. Um, our time, which was in the Wednesday, I think their time, they're about six hours ahead, or seven hours ahead. And um, so she says, Dear friends, forgive me for writing what is in my heart. Now the troops have withdrawn from Kiev, but everyone is waiting for a new blow. Ukraine is heavily bombed. I'm talking about small towns about Kyiv, Gostomi, Bucha, Irpin. There is now a cleansing going on. My house is located next to the destroyed cities. The territory where we live was also bombed, and there was a lot of destruction. I have friends who work there. They talk about such horrors. On the street, there are dead people who have been lying there for a month. There are no cities at all. Many women and girls are raped, some are killed. How can you be animals that rape a small girl, 11 years old, and then cut open the stomach and kill her? 
Animals don't do that. People were tortured and killed in their homes. You can see it by their tired hands, tight hands. They sent me pictures that are not on the internet. It's terrible. I don't know how to survive it. Many of my friends sent photos of their houses. They are just ruins. They have children that don't know where to go. They have no place to return to. I cry and understand that I just cannot help. I just can't imagine how people can live with a killer heart. Kill children, rape children, shoot and torture people. They found a grave where 300 tortured people were buried. A volunteer friend of mine found his parents killed who rotted in the street and the dogs took the body away. Our friends died, they were just killed in the street. People call me every day asking for help to survive pain, grief, death. I do not know what to say. In my heart is love washed by blood, love that has gone through fire, love that conquers death. But this is not enough for people now. The women are screaming, they don't want to live, they, don't want, they want to go to the grave with their torn children, and then more people will die. Please pray that God would give strength to endure and continue to live. Thank you for your heart and for your support. It is important for us to accept love bit by bit, and then it fills and heals the heart. High regards, Laura Pavlinko. So again, if you want to get to their Facebook page, just type in Qantas Club of Kiev, and she's done a pretty remarkable job of keeping that current. Also, if you go out to their Facebook page, um, they posted a lot of just horrendous photos of uh, what is happening there. So it's a great way to uh, uh, you know, see, keep, keep up with fellow Kiwanians that are just enduring some of the most unimaginable uh, tortures and uh, reckless uh, deaths that uh, mankind has ever known. So just keep them in your prayers more than anything. And I think that's a good segue probably to uh, do that. I do always come with a little membership moment. So I wanted to particularly thank <laughs> Carol and, and, uh, and Kelly for coming to our mid-year conference. I know a lot of our Valpo folks were there as well. And so I had the pleasure of presenting our new two for two campaign. So if you want to get a copy of this booklet, you can just go out to kiwanis.org backslash spell out two for two altogether and it'll sort of guide you through it. But this is a really a great one coming out from the pandemic for clubs to really work on uh, just having two people every month approach two prospects. And so it makes it very easy. It's sort of a, a systematic approach to uh, gaining members little by little rather than losing members. And then also I hope it's made its rounds here, the um, Kiwanis Magazine, and this is our annual membership issue. And so all you have to do is take off the front cover, put on maybe a little label about your club on the backside and uh, take that around to folks or leave it at the uh, auto dealer or your doctor's <laughs> office if they allow that. And uh, we appreciate your support. I'd be glad to talk to you about those down the way. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to, to be on this side of the podium. Um, yeah, Ukraine. Thanks, Brad, for your, for your work. Appreciate the work of Kiwanis. Um, I'm going to provide a little context before we get into content, uh, if you don't mind. TCM is 65 years old. We were founded in 1957 in Toronto, Canada by an Indiana pastor. And it was a church planting organization, uh, planting churches in and around Toronto, very successfully. And during the time that uh, Gene Doolin and his wife Lenora were planting those churches and they were growing, they had an influx of people from the USSR who had moved to North America to, to the United States as well as Canada, who became members of those churches and they got to hear about the persecution that was taking place at that time in the USSR. And they were moved by what they heard. And Mr. Doolin went to the USSR, specifically Russia, with a Russia that had immigrated to Canada, and he was served as his translator. And it was that time that he realized that there was there were a lot of underground believers that uh, could not worship freely. And so he had a three-week campaign were underground and come with clandestine meetings. He got to know those various leaders of 
that underground movement and fell in love with them. Found somebody to take over the church planting in Canada and then transitioned to uh, provide a benevolence work in USSR and provided Bibles printed in Russian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Ukrainian, and uh, food, medicine, a variety of different things. And over the course of 25 years, developed a real strong relationship and trust among the various leaders that were coming up through that underground movement. And when the wall, the, the Iron Curtain came down in November of 1989 and communism imploded in 1991, TCM had been there since 1974, developed a lot of trust, and they said at that time, don't leave us, don't leave us. Would you help us be better church planters, church pastors, church leaders, educators, in our own language? And so an educational movement began by TCM, and that's what we have been doing ever since. TCM International Institute, we now have 2,500 students at the master degree level from 45 different countries. Um, our background, however, uh, our history is dominated by what we've done in Eastern Europe which brings us to talking about Ukraine and what we're doing today. It was uh, the week of February 20th. We had in Austria at our facility at just outside of Vienna that we know as House Edelweiss. By the way, I've brought some of our quarterly publication here. This is the 50th anniversary of, sure, thanks Mike. Uh, this is our 50th anniversary of TCM owning House Edelweiss, uh, which was built in 1890. It's an amazing place, six acres, it's beautiful. Uh, people, when they come there, they talk about having a little slice of heaven. Uh, but uh, it has an amazing history, I'll not get into that as well, but uh, uh, if you really don't have time. But our regional leaders, the TCM regional representatives from around the world were gathered the week of February 20th for training. And it was during that time where a lot of talk had been happening throughout the news regarding the surrounding of Ukraine by the Russian military and lots of things on TV from President Putin about not intending to invade, just as this is all training. But it was on February 22nd, while our leadership was there, that uh, the invasion took place. And the meeting quickly changed its agenda to, I'll just say it like this, what we said was, how can we help? What can we do? That's what TCM has done for 65 years. That's been our question to people. How can we help? And they said, we need help that's short term, and we need help that's short, that's long term. And so we developed what we call the TCM, Inter I'm not asking, by the way, for any funding. I just want to share with you. But you'll take it. <laughs> I haven't, haven't turned any down yet. <laughs> but we developed the TCM International Health Relief Fund. Health stands for humanitarian aid, evangelism, logistics, and prayer. And we now, we have over a thousand of our TCM ministers, men and women who are at that master degree level. Many of them are graduates. They lead churches in their communities. They lead organizations in a, from a variety of different perspectives, orphanages, addiction centers, counseling centers throughout that part of the world. And they are all frontline in the bordering countries helping receive refugees, now over four million from Ukraine. Uh, I'll mention one right now, Hungary comes to mind. Dr. Joseph Steiner, a TCM graduate, he has his MA from TCM, his MDiv from TCM, and his doctorate from the University of Debrecen in Hungary. For the longest time, he was one of the executives of Hungar Hungarian Baptist Aid. Today, he's a professor for TCM, and he's our director of disciple-making movements in Europe. He's an amazing guy, really knows how to deal with emergencies and disasters. He, is, he and his wife and his, his family, along with members of their church, they are providing food, they are providing shelter. People in their churches are opening up their homes to Ukrainian refugees, welcoming them for a long period of time. It's not just a short stay and um, a variety of other things, transportation. And um, last week, Joseph and his son David 
who's also now a TCM student, they loaded up a box truck and with, with supplies provided from TCM that he purchased there. Um, and they drove it to Lviv. And uh, in the surrounding area of Lviv, because he had been contacted by several TCM graduates in that area that lead small churches. They had no food, they had no clean water. And he not only took ways for them to have clean water, but he provided food, medicines, etc. It was a pretty uh, tough trip that they had. Uh, but they made it, they made it back, and they're going back. We have similar kinds of stories from Poland, Romania, Moldova. I want to share this with you. This is uh, one of our graduates in, in Moldova. This video was done about March the 1st, right after all of this began. And there are 80 stations in Moldova receiving refugees. This is one of them. All of them are being manned by TCM International ministers. Yes, we can hear. Can't hear. Let me just tell you what he's saying. You've watched this a few times? Uh, just a couple. <laughs> um, this is Evgeny. A lot of, if you ever get stuck with the name, just say it's probably Evgeny. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good bet. This is, a, this is the only, this is the last remaining Soviet, Soviet built arena in the country, the little country that is southeast, formerly USSR country or state in Moldova. There are 800 refugees behind him and they are providing food and shelter and they are, at that time they were, they were rotating about 300 a day. 300 new, 300 would then move on. A lot of what's happening is people are moving from where these various refugee stations, they're moving west, getting especially into Germany. One of the things that's happened with this situation is that the EU has done something that is unprecedented. They have told the refugees from Ukraine, we will give you refugee visas for three years. They cut the red tape and making it very easy for these refugees to get refugee status, get visa status, which means they can apply for work, those kinds of things. It's great that they also can get benefits, uh, various services that they're going to be needing. Um, which leads me to the long term of what TCM is doing. Four million refugees have moved into these various countries. The majority of them probably will never return to Ukraine. And they're going to need lots of help when we talk about uh, PTSD, I gotta think PTSD for these folks is like nothing we've probably ever experienced or seen in this kind of a multitude. And one of the things that TCM is working on is the development of, because of what we have been doing, we are adding a chaplaincy program to our efforts. A lot of our folks are already chaplains, but we also see that the possibility of receiving some of these refugees and equipping them to be chaplains to their own people because that's what TCM has done. We educate and equip people in their own language, their own culture, their own countries, so they can reach their own people with the good news. And that's our long-term goal with regard to Ukraine. Let me share some voices of Ukraine with you, if you don't mind. This is from another Evgeny. I mentioned Evgeny. I've got three Evgenies that I'll refer to now. Actually, three more. This was, there's the fourth. This is from a, a man by the name of Zhenya Evgeny Sini from the city of Kherson. That's spelled K-H-E-R. The K is silent. It's pronounced Kherson. It's captive. It's, it's been captured by Russia. It was the first city to fall. It's a city of a quarter of a million people. And TCM has a training center in Kherson and lots of friends. We have over 300 students and graduates from Ukraine. Most of them are still there. This is one of them. He's 70 years old. He was a member of our first graduating class back in 1995. He's an engineer by trade. He was a shipbuilder, and he's a marvelous man and a dear friend. 
Here's a letter, that, uh, an email that he sent me. I cry a lot these days, so forgive me. Peace to you, dear David. Thank you so much for your love and support. The fact that you remember us and go through the horrors of war with us encourages us. We do not lose heart. For the past few days around the city, we have been hearing volleys of heavy guns from which the earth groans. Lines outside the supermarkets are getting longer every day. Ira, that's his wife, Ira and I do not feel the need for anything. For example, a couple of days ago, a young guy, the son, the son of friends, came to us. This is him calling them. <laughs> I wish it was. For example, a couple of days ago, a young guy, the son of our friends, came to us and brought us a small piece of dried meat. This is not dog meat. It's not cat meat. This is pig meat. Now every day, Ira cuts off a piece of this meat, and we enjoy it. It's a delicacy. The Lord takes care of us. We try to help our neighbors and poor people. For example, an elderly couple lives not far from us. They have a cow and treat their old neighbors with milk. But because of the stress from the explosion, from the poor feed that the cows have, they've reduced their milk supply. I grew up in a village and I know what to do. I have a businessman friend who has a small factory where he produces sunflower oil. As a result of production of sunflower, waste remains, and the cow loves to drink tea from the waste. <laughs> I, bought, I brought about 20 kilograms of waste from this businessman, and people began to give their cow a fine tea to drink. The cow, in gratitude, began to give a lot of milk again. <laughs> The next day, these people brought us two liters of milk. At that moment, we remembered that the young couple that lives next to us have a little girl. She is crying because she needs milk, which is not currently in the stores. Ira gave the girl these two liters of milk. Her parents accepted our gift with tears in their eyes, and we thank the Lord for his mercy to our people and to us. Every day brings us its surprises, and we do not sit idle. Keep praying, David, because only he, our Lord, is the Prince of Peace. Let me see if I can find one more voice, and then I'd love to answer any questions you might have. This voice is from Yulia Lubinets. Yulia Lubinets is a lady who is, she speaks five languages, She's Ukrainian. She also lives in here, so she's a professor for TCM. Uh, she's amazing. She's been to Indiana. She's been here to visit us. She's spoken around the country on behalf of TCM. This is an email that my wife received from her a couple of weeks ago. Our city is surrounded, but it has been quiet for a couple of days. I believe it is because God hears the prayers of his children all over the world. Today, I talked to a young woman from a nearby village, which is, which is occupied now. Her family stayed for three days there without electricity, running water, gas, and heat. So they have decided to try to move to Kherson, despite the, despite the danger of shooting. She said that some of the villagers have been taken as hostages and put in the buses. They are kept on the bridge outside of Kherson so that Ukrainians would not try to capture the bridge back. They, please pray for those people. War is such a horrible thing. God takes care of us, and I believe in his mercy and protection. Please, for the faith, we, please pray for faith to grow stronger in such a time. Please pray for me to be a good witness to my father and an unbelieving friend, Oksana, and her family. Pray for their salvation. Please continue praying. God is our only hope and he is good, I believe that. Three nights later, Stephanie got this and it was all from her. The Russians are right under our window. Tanks and armed men on the ground. Please pray, Stephanie. 
Uh, we heard from Yulia yesterday. We hadn't heard from Yulia for about two weeks. And uh, she, she lives with her 84-year-old father, who uh, he said, you know what? They talked about leaving Ukraine, and he had been very against that. He said, no, let's, let's stay at, stick it out. But yesterday he said, you know, there's only one place I would feel safe in going if we were to leave. And it would be to House Edelweiss in Austria. And so she sent a note to us yesterday and asked if she and her father could come to House Edelweiss and live. And we said, please go. And so they're on their way to Austria. We have others there from Ukraine that have become a part of our TCM family. Uh, a family that came in 2014. They were refugees because of the invasion of Crimea in 2014. A lot of people don't talk about that, but there were 15,000 Ukrainians killed in 2014 when the Russians took over Crimea. And uh, anyway, do you have any questions? Yes. David, you, you, as part of your acronym HELP, we'll talk about logistics. Uh -huh. When you hear that Congress appropriates, uh, appropriated this week another $100, $100 million to the Ukraine relief. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that money goes? Well, I, I would imagine, I am hopeful, and I believe that it goes to those various countries that are both receiving them, but also to Ukraine itself. It's going to take decades to rebuild. Right now, that $100 million is not for rebuilding. It is for providing aid. That's my understanding. And it will be, uh, the majority, I believe, will be utilized within Ukraine. But as Ukrainians are moving out, which they continue to do, and it's changed, by the way, the initial movement, most of those people have their own automobiles, cars, vans, etc. But now it's more mass transit. And Is there a system in place to distribute those funds? I really don't know. We do for what we're doing. And we're, we're working with the local and the, the federal governments on those borders. It's not TCM by ourselves. We are working right along with them. And so we, we believe the support that we've received, it's, it's being utilized uh, almost as a leverage with regard to the, the help that's being given. Not a great answer for you because there are just so many unknowns. Roger? Mm -hmm. During the passage out of Ukraine as a refugee, how safe is that? That's a great question. And one of the things that he asked, how safe is that passage out of Ukraine? They are working to make it as safe as possible. Well, one of the things that certainly we never thought about happened beginning the first week. Uh, our people were seeing this happen. Um, and it's been one of the things that federal governments of those various countries are trying to to help, and, and that is uh, human trafficking. With, with all the evil that is happening and all of the, these, these issues that are taking place, there are still people on those borders who really are trying to take advantage of the situation, and they will offer rides, they will say, hey, let us get you to where you need to go, and then they wind up God knows where. And we think that's been really um, dealt with and I wouldn't say eliminated, but it's certainly been reduced a great deal. But we, early on, and especially the first week, we heard a, a great deal of that. Aren't some of those also going into Russia? They're taking them over into the border, and they don't uh, have any idea that they're doing that. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, but you know, early on, before the invasion, uh, Russia actually offered uh, to a lot of the Ukrainians in the eastern portion, like in the Crimea area, they were giving them $130 a piece to take a train and head back on into Russia. By the way, that is one thing too we're doing. Uh, a lot of these folks, the majority, uh, they have very little money in their pockets. And so as they are in our, as we're helping them, we do provide them with money for gas, money for transportation. And that's something that typically we don't do. This is a different situation and one of the things that's very important is to help people maintain their dignity. And one, they don't ask for the money. You just give it to them. And that's what we do. Yes, sir. Uh, in 2007, my wife and I hosted a foreign exchange student from Moldova. And we actually didn't know anything about that part of the world, uh -huh. country, sir. And, uh, and we 
kept in touch with her over the years. She's been back here a number of times. And, uh, you mentioned there were 80 centers in, in Moldova. Yeah. Moldova only has about 2 million people. Yeah. It's, a, it's about the third the size of Indiana. It's right on the border. And it's a very, very poor country. It is. in agriculture. And, but the thing that I worry about, about Moldova is on the western part of Moldova, they have a Russian separatist they sure do. area called uh, Transnistra. Yes, they do. Which is, um, so they're very, you know, potential candidate, I don't think he's out, but uh, similar to um, Ukraine in the sense that they were part of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia. <clears throat> you know, the, the western part is very Russian leaning, but it, or the eastern part, the western part is mostly ethnic Romanian, which is where our right. student was from. They want to be, they're pro uh, Europe, they want to be part of the European Union. So there's, uh, they're at risk, so to speak, I think, and I worry about that. But also, our exchange student's um, husband, his cousins are in, uh, they were from Odessa, they, they, uh, they're staying with them, so they're, they're hosting refugees. And <clears throat> it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a very sad situation, obviously. And, you know. Yeah, Moldova is one of the poorest countries in Europe. Their average income is about $100 per month per individual. It's very poor. Um, do, you, do you have a special fund that has been set up within TCM, or are you accepting donations to your organization as a whole that you allocate toward? No, any, anything that comes to TCM that is earmarked, that has a memo, or uh, has come through that fund, 100% uh, of that is going into uh, help with the Ukrainian relief. And, and will Kelly have, can you do a link? I can. Yeah. Through Kelly? Thank you. Yes, I can. Okay. Any other questions? Given the knowledge I hear, there are quite a few Ukrainians that are making it to the southern border in Mexico. Are there plans as to, I, I don't know how they get there and, and how they're the chosen view. You know? Yeah. Uh, my understanding is there is a lot of Ukrainians that are at the southern border. I don't know too much about that. And anything that I would say would probably be wrong, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll not go there. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're very common. Uh, I will tell you this, I've got lots of friends and, and just lovely people that I know and love in Ukraine and throughout that part of the world. We also have friends in Russia. And uh, um, another country that I'd also just mentioned is Belarus. Belarus Moldova, Belarus, Estonia, all of these countries are former USSR states. Every one of them is concerned about becoming, you know, people say, ask me, they'll say, David, what do you think President Putin, you know, what do I know? I'm a kid from Beach Grove. I don't know. But my response is, I think he wants to get the band back together, to tell you the truth. And I think the band that he wants to get back together is the USSR. And uh, I know that Belarus, they've got a dictator that is a puppet of Putin who's a puppet of somebody else, by the way, that I won't get into. But Belarus, we have 80 ministers that are TCM educated, and we speak to them all the time. They are, they are a population held captive. And when you've got guards at the border pointing the gun at the people, like they had in Poland back in the 1940s, you've got a problem. And that's the situation in Belarus. How much, how many of the Russian people themselves do you think have any understanding of the truth about what's happening? I think very little. The question is, how many people in Russia do you think have any understanding? I, I think, Carol, that you believe what you're told, especially when you're told time and time again, and you don't have any other sources to contradict it. And I, I, you know, I kind of don't hold them at fault. They don't have any other perspective. But as of last night, 80% are in favor of what's happening. And we have heard from a couple of our, our graduates there, and we find it hard to believe some of the things that they are saying as well, because it's, it's right in line with what I just said. There are reports along those lines that say the Russian troops that are coming in have been told that they're liberating the Ukrainians. Yes. And they don't understand why they're not welcome there. Are you seeing that too? We've we've heard that. Um, 
fighting Nazism. And, yeah, fighting Nazism and, and doing a cleansing and those kinds of things. It's 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 terrible. And it's just lies that are unbelievable. But unfortunately, a lot of people are believing them. David, are your TCM people in Russia? able to do their work openly, or is it still, is it a very underground? Um, they, they, were, they were doing it very openly, Mary. Uh, I don't know right now if they're able to. Uh, it's been rather difficult even the last couple of years for them because there have been some new restrictions placed on them. Uh, for example, in the, the concept of evangelism became illegal. Um, and, and so they didn't want anybody changing their faiths and those kinds of things. Can I share with you one thing? I didn't plan on doing this, but I'd like to leave you on maybe a more high note. It's not a joke, I promise. Uh, it's actually a song that I've written. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll, I'll share the words with you. You want the right brothers? <laughs> <laughs> they have a That's group. Good. The family has a group. Like Lloyd and David. Yeah. Um, you see, no, you sing with the right brothers. <laughs> the right brothers. Different right brothers. <laughs> the right right brothers. The indie right. right. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry. Just brothers. <laughs> this, you know, as I was watching TV a few few weeks ago, when I mean, this all started, I was just devastated, and uh, I asked myself, "What would you do, David? If this was you." And uh, so. This is a lyric, and uh, my, my writing partner is working on the, the music side. And we're gonna release this on uh, April 29th. It's called, What Would You Do, in parentheses. It's a lament for Ukraine. What would you do? What would we do if our walls crumbled? What would we say or would we just mumble? Our words fade to groans that become our deep prayers. Your Holy Spirit, please lead us there. To the Lord's throne room, through Jesus alone, your Father Creator, we long to be home. We are mere pilgrims who sojourn this land. By your side forever we'll cling to your hand. Wondering hopefully, wonderfully, wondering hopefully, knowing you care. The lamp to our feet, whose light we must share. Jesus completed his work on that tree. It's his face we long for and someday we'll see. What would we do? What would we say? Heaven, please help us. There's only one way. Roads with will have detours, dead ends at times. Your narrow path is the one we must find. Thank Wonderful. We hear about <clears throat> what's going on in Ukraine um, every day on television and radio, but I think that um, we have really no idea until someone such as you brings it down to a personal level. And I think that's important for all of us to hear. So I thank you so very much for being here and for sharing uh, what you know about the situation and your friends and and what you've heard from them. Thank you, thank you very much. We are going to be making a donation in your honor to Indiana Youth Group, uh, an organization that creates safer spaces to foster community and provides programming that empowers LGBTQ and youth and magnifies their voices. And after this wonderful program, boy, you just, you just wonder, boy, how can we live in a beautiful city and country and, and even imagine that this kind of atrocity is happening? So uh, everyone have a good end of the week, a good weekend. Our pray prayers go to the people of Ukraine and those of our organization who are there and 